So this guy goes back to Dushanbe and he calls the CIA on a secure line and tells them Masood's been assassinated. And then uh, eight, hours, eight hours later, it's moving on CNN. <laughs> Uh, and he calls back to his liaison and says, you've put me in a very difficult position. This was supposed to be a secret. And the CIA guy said, well, you know, look, I mean, we're, our duty is when we have news that affects, you know, international affairs, we have to tell the White House we can't control what they do with the information once they have it. He is here tonight to present his latest book, Directorate S, which picks up where Ghost Wars left off. The New York Times calls it a book of surpassing excellence. In each chapter, Call takes a deep dive into some particular facet of the conflict. And The Guardian writes that Director F takes readers deep into the malevolent intrigues of spycraft with its cast of colorful characters. The story is delivered with a literary prowess that has been absent in previous Western accounts of America's longest running war. We're very pleased to bring the discussion to Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me in welcoming Steve Call. I've been talking about the book for a couple of weeks, and I find when I go on the radio and, you know, I feel sorry for the host who has this, like, 680-page book that they're supposed to have digested. And, of course, as an author, your expectation is only that they read the press release, not that they read the book. But I find that uh, many of the uh, interviews begin with the question, what is Director Adess? So I think that's helpful as an orientation, uh, which is that it's the covert action arm of the Pakistani intelligence service which is usually referred to as ISI. And it has been around, uh, as long as ISI has been around in one way or another, but during the 1980s, as is chronicled in, in Ghost Wars, the CIA and the ISI collaborated on a covert action to arm and fund the Afghan Mujahideen to defeat or challenge the Soviet occupation. So the CIA knew all about Directorate S. Um, but later, in uh, the war after 2001, ISI went back into action to support the Taliban's revival, this time against NATO and American forces in Afghanistan. So that's, that's where that title comes from. So during the 1980s, ISI grew up uh, because of the massive injection of funds from the United States and Saudi Arabia to become you know, a large institution in Pakistan within the army, commanded by the army, about 25,000 plus personnel at various times, civilians and military. And um, it became a kind of state within the state, as Pakistanis would describe it, a corrosive force often in domestic politics and certainly in charge of this covert foreign policy across the border into Kashmir, uh, as well as across the border into Afghanistan through the Taliban. So this narrative opens uh, um, on the eve of September 11th and comes forward to something like the present day, and it's kind of um, toggles between uh, Islamabad and Rawalpindi in Pakistan, where, where ISI and the Army are, Washington, D.C., particularly in the decision-making of U.S. strategy and policy at different intervals of the war, and then in Kabul, uh, concentrating on the Afghan intelligence service, which is known as NDS, as well as the ARG palace, where the president of Afghanistan and his cabinet preside. So in my kind of introduction of the book, it's, uh, I was going to try to talk about four things uh, and give you a flavor of the narrative around these themes. And then um, you know, take your questions so we can jump all over. So the four things I want to talk about are basically rooted in a question that recurs uh, as a source of confusion in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and to some extent in the later stages of the war in Washington as well, which is if the uh, Bush administration and then the Obama administration understood that ISI was supporting the Taliban uh, while receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in aid uh, while the, the Taliban attacked U.S. soldiers and positions in Afghanistan. Why did it allow this to go on? How did this, how did this go on? And uh, as it turns out, Painfully, episode by episode, neither the Bush administration nor the Obama administration could find the will or, or the way to change the equation uh, across the border. But their failures and the book's narrative is much broader than the problem of Director at S. And it's, it's, so the four things, the four themes I want to use to frame a kind of introduction to the story are um, essentially answers to the question of why did the United States fail to achieve its aims in Afghanistan after 2001. The first 
set of problems I want to talk about is the problem of war aims, the contradictions and confusions in American war aims at different phases of the, of the history. Um, the second is the failure of our relationship with Hamid Karzai and, and the failure of our investments more broadly in democratic Afghan politics. The third is <laughs> the illusions that became the basis for the largest scale counterinsurgency campaign that we carried out, uh, particularly during the first years of the, of the Obama administration. And then finally, the failure of political and diplomatic strategy um, at different phases of the, of the war. So let me start with the story of uh, the confusing and dispiriting story of American war aims in Afghanistan. You know, the Bush administration, particularly after 2006 and the Obama administration, must have carried out more than a dozen classified strategy reviews of, of, the, of, of American goals in the Afghan war. As I kind of excavated the calendar and the discussions and the debates in these reviews, I found out, I, f I discovered they were pretty much all taking place in the same fourth floor classified conference room in the Eisenhower Executive Office building. <laughs> year after year, different groups of interagency teams would reassemble. They would last for many days. The reviews would often start with the same uh, tempo where the intelligence analysts would come in in the morning and unfurl these top secret maps of Afghanistan with all 400 districts color coded to indicate who controlled what and they would provide a briefing to the decision makers about the ethnic demography of the war and how it was shifting and then the analysts would usually leave and the policy makers would start to debate what should be done. And one of the uh, problems that recurred in these debates was what to do about the Taliban. So taken as an example, the two reviews that took place during 2009 and the first year of the Obama administration. The very experienced policymakers around the table, at least at the kind of deputy level of the review, um, they understood the region reasonably well. They certainly had a lot of information uh, to work with. And they did what you would hope uh, decision makers would do when they're about to send young American men and women to combat. They spent a lot of time talking about, well, what are our vital interests in this war? A phrase that you, know, you might use to justify the sacrifices that, that they were planning to ask uh, soldiers and Marines and others to make. And they really talked about this at some length, and they identified two interests that were paramount and, and could justify um, the war that they were about to escalate. One was Al-Qaeda, which in 2009 was still very active uh, in carrying out international attacks and attempting international attacks from uh, Waziristan in Pakistan mostly and also from Pakistani cities. And the second was the security of Pakistan's nuclear weapons, uh, which if they fell into the wrong hands, you know, could create a devastating crisis. Okay, well, let's pause and reflect on those two interests, vital enough to justify sending young men and, Ameri and, and, and women to war. Neither of them was located in Afghanistan in 2009. Al-Qaeda had left Af Afghanistan in 2002 under the pressure of the bombing of the fall of 2001 and migrated largely into Pakistan. And, of course, Pakistan's nuclear weapons were in Pakistan. And so the group kind of identified this contradiction, this, this sort of anomaly, and concluded that nonetheless it was important to send tens of thousands of more soldiers to Afghanistan to um, stabilize the country because if it collapsed, Al-Qaeda would come back. So that's a plausible fear in 2009, but it's a kind of indirect and somewhat subjective reason, speculative reason even, to fight a war. So then they fell into another set of discussions, both in the late Bush administration and the early Obama administration. If Al-Qaeda is the enemy, what, what exactly do we mean? Do we just mean a small group called Al-Qaeda? Typically, if you look back at what was told uh, to, the, to the public, the phrase that was often used was Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. So then they would get into these debates about whether the Taliban were an affiliate of, of Al-Qaeda. Um, of course, there were no Afghans on the plane on September 11th. Uh, the Taliban uh, did fight 
ardently against NATO forces in Afghanistan, which they regarded as occupation forces. They didn't carry out international attacks uh, against uh, the United States or Europe. And President Obama was quite clear by the fall of 2009, he'd really lost faith in the possibility of a big counterinsurgency war, even while he was uh, overseeing it. And he definitely did not want to fight a long-term war against the Taliban. I thought that it was unwinnable on the timelines and, with the, and at, at any acceptable cost. Uh, some of his aides at the White House and elsewhere agreed with him about that, but there were many at the Pentagon who felt they had to fight the Taliban and that they had committed to fight the Taliban. And in these reviews in the Situation Room or in this conference room in the Eisenhower Building, at one point they got into this big argument about whether the United States had actually ever committed to defeating the Taliban. And even Bob Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time, a holdover from the Bush administration, said, we can't defeat the Taliban militarily on any acceptable timeline at any acceptable cost. They're part of Afghanistan. They're an indigenous movement. Um, they may be abhorrent, but they're embedded. And the Pentagon said, well, I'm sorry, you already have pledged uh, to, to win this war. And the other people on the other side of the table said, no, we didn't. We've never quite said that. We've always talked about pressuring them or changing the momentum. So the Pentagon went away, and the next day they came back with this giant PowerPoint deck, which they put up on the screens, carrying all the statements of American presidents and senators and others basically <laughs> promising to defeat the Taliban. And uh, they said, hey, you may not have, you know, you may not like it, but this is what you've told people you're going to do. Um, President Obama could just, he just could not figure out how to resource the war against the Taliban enough to make progress in it or to define his war aims narrowly enough to focus only on al-Qaeda so that the Taliban problem could be avoided. And so the reviews ended up with language basically declaring war aims of we're going to degrade the Taliban or we're going to reverse its momentum. Language quite vague, subjective, really not the basis for sending um, you know, anybody to war. Now you could, you could make a more positive case for that uh, outcome. You could say, well, it was really just a time buying exercise to hand the war off to um, the Afghans while the Afghans were trained to fight it. So the degrading and the reversing of momentum was really a way of describing a transition strategy that had the Afghans taking the lead in the war against the Taliban. But it's not the language that was used even, uh, uh, nobody wants to go fight a war uh, for, a, for a transition strategy. And so there was always a kind of evasion around this. Um, might sound familiar from another war in American history. There was, uh, you know, the, the lead envoy to the Afghan war during this period was Richard Holbrook, probably well known to some of you. Um, a very large figure. Um, he and Obama did not get along. Uh, it was plain that partly because he had advised Hillary Clinton so closely during the campaign, that residue remained with, at the staff level. But he also had a manner that uh, the president found irritating, and he made that plain to his aides, who probably reinforced that instinct that he had. And uh, one of the things that, that irritated the White House was that Holbrook would talk about Vietnam, where he had served as a young foreign service officer in the, in the Mekong Delta. And he would caution the president of the White House about the analogy between the escalation that they were about to carry out, the vagueness of their war aims, the faith in a transition strategy, and the pressure that they were receiving from the Pentagon to move faster and bigger on timelines that the president didn't really believe in, and to remind them that, you know, seen this movie before. And, and the, the White House found that very irritating. This is not Vietnam. Uh, and this is a different time and place. It's a different story. And uh, I remember, I, like a lot of reporters, I tried to talk to Holbrook as much as I could. He was what in journalism we would call good for journalism. Um, and uh, on background, but I follow the Bob Woodward rule, stays on background until you're deceased. And I went back through my notes um, uh, for this book. And I, I, I talked to him one time when he came right back from the White House, and he was very much aware that he had 
really irritated, estranged the White House with his talk of Vietnam, and he was telling me that. He said, you know, I feel terribly like I've really kind of cut myself out here by, by bringing this subject up. And then he paused and he said, they shouldn't be afraid of history. So losing Hamid Karzai, it became fashionable reading the paper and just following the war to think of Karzai as unstable and kind of consumed by conspiracy theories. And there's no question that his behavior in private was often unbalanced. And the book describes this again and again. But why did Karzai come to so doubt the intentions of the United States, the international community? <coughs> You know, I, I was sort of covering the war as a beat reporter for The New Yorker during some of these years. I would go out there. I've interviewed him a couple of times. I saw people at the palace as regularly as I could. I didn't appreciate um, one thing that kind of really came through when I went back and excavated as much as I could of his interactions with the Americans over different phases of the war. Every time an American came in to see him at almost any level of government, Karzai would begin his part of the meeting by saying, you've got to do more about Pakistan. You've got to do more about ISI. The war is over the border. These people are coming in with impunity, and they're going back with impunity. You're not doing anything about it. Now, of course, you can say this was a way for him to evade responsibility for his own failures of government, his own failures of, of, uh, of corruption and, and uh, the warlordism. And it was a, an evasion, but it was also a uh, very consistent and very widely held um, view of what was, what was the, at the root of failure in the war. And no matter how often he would repeat this concern, there's a scene where candidate Obama comes in to see the cabinet in the summer of 2008, his first visit to Afghanistan while he's the Democratic Party's nominee. And the cabinet, which is you know, kind of feuding with itself and divided along ethnic and other lines, they kind of have a pre-meeting. They think there's a pretty good chance Obama could be the next president. So let's rehearse what we're going to say. We're going to go around the table. Everyone's going to say something. And they all agreed, everyone will say the problem is ISI. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they used their time with him to do. And uh, uh, Obama asked whether the civilian government in Pakistan could do something about this. And Karzai answered, not without the help of the United States. The problem is ISI, which runs the country. So Karzai took it for granted that the US as the world's supreme military power could force ISI to stop aiding the Taliban if it really wanted to. And since the US didn't take this action, uh, Karzai over time sunk into conspiracy thinking. And he thought, well, there must be another explanation. They have the power to do it. They're not doing it. Therefore, what, they're, what they want is for ISI to destabilize Afghanistan, to keep the war running so that the United States can justify having military bases in Afghanistan for the long term against Iran, against China, whatever. Now, the Americans confused him about this uh, as well, because when Joe Biden came over in early 2009 to meet with Karzai, they felt that the Bush administration had coddled him, had been too accommodating of his uh, poor governance. And so Biden went over to send a message. And he sat down. And the first thing Karzai said was, you got to do more about Pakistan. The problem is ISI. And Biden replied, Mr. Mr. President, Pakistan is 50 times more important than Afghanistan for the United States. Now, this aggravated Karzai, <laughs> as you can imagine, <laughs> combined with his uh, theory about why the US might be deliberately destabilizing uh, or accommodating ISI. And it contributed to his estrangement and his defiance of the United States. And he refused to negotiate some transition treaties that the US wanted. At one point in 2013, the Americans were so frustrated with this recurrent theme that they sent uh, an envoy, a successor to Holbrook named James Dobbins, over to, to meet with Karzai. And Dobbins recalls sitting down with him in the Arg Palace, trying to persuade him to drop this, this conspiracy theory. And he says, Mr. President, between Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks, you have several million documents you can examine. Can you find any mention of the designs that you're describing? Do you really think you know, that I would lie to you about this? And Karzai pauses, kind of half-jokingly says, maybe you don't know about the plan. <laughs> <laughs> he, says, <laughs> he says, there is a deep state in America. Um, So a third 
um, framing of the narrative is the failure of this uh, set of illusions that inform counterinsurgency doctrine in the United States uh, coming out of the perceived success of the surge in Baghdad uh, in 2006 and 2007, or 2007, 2008. And uh, this idea that if the triumphalism and the lessons of, of Baghdad in 2008 could be just shifted over now to Afghanistan in 2009, that the whole kind of structure of the war, the narrative of the war would also shift and the Taliban would be knocked far enough back to either force them to negotiations or to mass defections or to something like the, the uh, awakening in Iraq. And uh, they went back down into the situation room you know, numerous times to talk about this uh, idea of the war because it was the rationale in, in doc doctrinal terms for sending 100,000 Americans to combat at the peak by 2010, 2011. We had 150,000 international forces at the peak during 2010, 2011, if you add the NATO forces on top of the Americans. And that's not counting the Afghans. Um, but there was a math problem right away. So typically in counterinsurgency doctrine theory, you want a uh, ratio of about 20 soldiers and police to every 1,000 local inhabitants, but that would require as many as 600,000 security forces in Afghanistan, which was a un highly unrealistic number. So they narrowed the problem by identifying 80 key terrain districts out of Afghanistan's approximately 400 administrative districts, and these were places in Taliban country, mainly in the deep south and along the border with Pakistan. But the key terrain districts formulation kind of reduced the theoretical math of how many troops you needed to achieve this connection of the population with the government. But it just became an overdetermined kind of engineering diagram. And it birthed this jargon-filled language of acronyms and district stability frameworks. I had you know, my own notebooks from going to briefings during trips to Kabul or running over to the Pentagon to hear the latest update on the war. And one phrase that jumped out at me when I went back through those notebooks was a Pentagon colonel telling us, it's great to make sure the population is attached to the government. And it almost sounded like a slogan of Soviet theory, you know, some kind of <laughs> workers. Uh, so the mantra was clear, build, clear, hold, build, transfer, meaning transfer territory rid of Taliban influence to a legitimate Afghan government and its security forces. But as Sherard Coper Coles, the British envoy who had two years of hard experience in Kabul told Richard Holbrook in July 2009, Afghan capacity is an illusion. The entire sequence of hold, build, transfer is based on wishful thinking. The White House's uh, chief war czar during these years, Doug Lute, put it to Obama this way around, around the same time. Mr. President, you can send a battalion of US Marines not only anywhere in Afghanistan, but literally anywhere in the world, and they'll clear an area. And as long as you're willing to keep them there, they'll hold it. The problem is hand, handing the cleared area to the, to, to the Afghan government and doing something with it. Toward the end of uh, 2010, Holbrook, uh, who died in December of that year, uh, wrote a memo to Hillary Clinton. Um, and he basically sounded like he was, he was giving up. Um, he said, the best that can be hoped for is a bloody stalemate. And that was in 2010. And we have that bloody stalemate today. I'm just going to read one thing, uh, since I'm doing OK on time. Um, about the counterinsurgency war. So what, what actually happened when we sent these 100,000 Americans out to Kandahar and Helmand? You've probably seen some of the documentaries or read some of the accounts, memoirs of fighting on the ground. But one of the biggest campaigns, the bloodiest campaign, apart from the Marines in Helmand, was fought by a couple of task forces to the west of Kandahar, trying to clear an area south of Highway 1 that is very heavily irrigated, referred to as the green zone. And it's an, a remarkable landscape um, of grape orchards and berms, 10-foot marijuana plants, uh, absolutely thick canopy of foliage. And the Taliban, since 2006, had to embed themselves in this green zone. 
and had fought off basically the Canadians and then a couple of other attempts to clear them out of it. And the, uh, the whole idea of the sacrifice of this war was partly to finally clear out this, this foliage uh, in the desert, you know, well to the west of Kandahar because the Taliban's presence there was menacing the city. And by this point, the U.S. military was so strained that it had to cobble together units to fight on the ground. And for example, in, the, in this case, they had to convert an artillery unit to an infantry unit. So, you know, artillery units are, are trained to fight with big guns from a distance, uh, and their officers and, and, and non-commissioned officers and enlisted men don't have a lot of experience of infantry tactics, and, in, and never mind in an environment like this one, which was worse than, than Normandy for the obstacles and the booby traps, the IEDs. So I'll just read you a little bit about the war they fought. Uh, the initial phase of Colonel Art Kandarian's campaign in the Green Zone wasn't much different from that of the U.S. Army in, in the American West during the 19th century, build forts in Indian country and poke around. The task force's engineering units designed a crude combat outpost, a COP or COP as it was rendered in jargon, that could be erected in 10 to 14 days. The outposts were usually about 200 meters by 250 meters in area. The outer walls were made of HESCO gabions, manufactured blast walls of dirt held together by mesh wire 11 feet high and 7 feet thick. The standard outpost design included uh, raid cameras with infrared capabilities that allowed the soldiers to watch their perimeter from behind the HESCO walls. But the Taliban could usually see them better than they could see the Taliban. Combat engineers erected tall observation towers where the Taliban could easily spot Americans. In June, a sniper killed Brandon King of the 1 320th, the artillery misfits shooting him square in the face as he stood on watch in a tower. Platoons depended on their most experienced sergeants to survive. Sergeant Josh Strickland had served two tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan before joining 3rd Platoon A Battery of the 1 320th. During his first couple of weeks at Combat Outpost Nolan, Strickland's patrols could not walk 100 yards without hitting an IED or getting lit up by Taliban from several sides. Listening to enemy radio talk, they learned the enemy knew they were artillery, not infantry. The Taliban said these are not real war fighters. The platoons paid heavy losses to prove they were wrong. The first time Strickland's platoon got hit, he saw a young artilleryman burst out crying. The soldier screamed again and again, I didn't sign up for this shit. In general, Strickland thought the lowest ranking first time soldiers adjusted to the stress better than the more experienced artillerymen because the rookies had no expectations from prior deployments. Because of Strickland's experience and uncanny ability to avoid IEDs, Soldiers continually asked him to walk point on their patrols. He chose to walk 10 to, 15 ahead, 10 to 15 feet ahead of everyone else so that he could carefully identify the best route and so that if he did make a mistake, it would cost one life instead of several. He was ultimately wounded and medevac to Kandahar Airfield four times. Each time as he recovered in the hospital, a doctor would ask Strickland if he wanted to go back or go home. What am I going to say, he thought. He went back. Day after day, in platoon after platoon, they shouldered their loads, stepped out on, quote, presence patrols, unquote, and hoped for the best. They walked past villagers near their outposts who were neither helpful nor hostile. One elder near Strickland's base kept a pigeon that he would let fly every time a, a, a platoon departed, apparently to let Taliban know they were on the march. So that was the war that was conceived in these uh, conference rooms and the war that was experienced on the ground a long ways away from, from those rooms. So finally, let me talk about the failure of political and diplomatic strategy. I kind of alluded to it in talking about Holbrook before. There were other failures uh, involving Karzai when we tried to um, change the candidates for the 2009 election, try to find someone to run against Karzai. Uh, he found out about these efforts um, and then won the re-election anyway, so we ended up with the worst of both worlds uh, and infuriated Karzai, who was in power for five more years. We uh, solicited so many candidates to run against him during the spring that one time when Holbrook went out to Kabul, he ran into a, a guy who's, I think now, maybe the vice president of Afghanistan, Ahmad Zia Massoud, a brother of the former legendary guerrilla commander. And uh, Ahmad Zia ran into him someplace um, near the ARG and said, 
I think I am pretty much the only plausible candidate for the presidency of Afghanistan that you have not asked to run. <laughs> so I'm, I'm insulted. I want you to note that. Um, but the broader failure of politics and of uh, diplomacy uh, is much bigger picture than just the Afghan elections. Um, virtually every American commander who went out to lead the war would say in public, we cannot win this war militarily. There is no purely military solution. Um, I think it was David Petraeus, the, the advocate for counterinsurgency doctrine, who said, you can't capture and kill your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. He said that during his tour of command in 2011. And yet, year after year, it was military action that was resourced and prioritized, and it was diplomacy that was either carried out in small compartmented secret operations or not resourced at all. The dispiriting impression, uh, well, really narrative that comes out of excavating um, these years is that um, at least in the Afghan war, the United States was unable to unify the several wars it was fighting uh, in the field. There's a review at the end of the Bush administration that starts with a slide presentation titled 10 Wars. During Obama's years, after these interagency reviews, the Pentagon would fight its war on the ground with 150,000 combat troops. The CIA would fight its war with drones over the border in Afghanistan. And the diplomacy was left to a secret cell created in the White House called the Conflict, Revo Conflict Resolution Cell was a highly compartmented group that was meant to open up direct discussions with the Taliban. It took them a couple of years to even identify uh, who the Taliban negotiator on the other side might be. Eventually, the Germans uh, brought forward a, a young man named Tayyab Aga, who um, said he was the head of the Taliban political commission and was authorized to negotiate with the Americans about terms under which the United States might reduce its forces or leave. It took a while to vet whether this was the real thing, eventually the Americans concluded toward the end of uh, Holbrook's life that Tayabaga was in fact the authorized negotiator of a political commission that reported at least up to Mullah Mansour, the number two at the time, and maybe to Mullah Muhammad Omar as well. So they set up the first meeting in a safe house outside of Munich, and the, this German uh, diplomat named Michael Steiner had been kind of brokering the arrangements to get the Americans to sit down across the table from this guy. And in the fall of 2010, he comes to the White House National Security Council and he says, okay, Tayabaga is ready to go to the meeting. We're ready to facilitate the meeting. But he has one concern. He's seen a lot of his comrades go to meetings like this with the Americans and then get snatched and sent off to Guantanamo or to CIA prisons. And he's worried about that. Um, so the National Security Council staff reports this to President Obama, who says, look, give Tayabaga my personal guarantee that, if he, that we're not going to snatch him at this meeting. He can come to the meeting. We're just going to talk. No matter what happens in the discussions, he'll be safe, and we'll take him back to Qatar. Uh, so the National Security Council staff relays this to the Germans. The Germans relay it to Tayabaga. The German intelligence service says, OK, we'll arrange a private jet in Qatar to pick him up and fly him to Munich for this, for this meeting. Now the National Security staff uh, council staff in Washington is having their last round of prep meetings. And they say, you know what? Just in case there's some kind of automated snatch operation down in the target list bowels of the intelligence system, let's not tell the CIA about this meeting or this plane <laughs> so that we can guarantee uh, President Obama's promise. So essentially, one part of the government uh, deceived another part of the government in order to carry out a a secret diplomatic operation without being interfered with. When I, now, you know, maybe that was an unjustifiable anxiety, but I'm telling you it was held at the highest levels of the National Security Council. <laughs> kind of got my attention. Maybe we should all be worried about automated target lists. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, these talks went on for two and a half years. They failed for a whole bunch of interesting reasons. Um, and one of them was Karzai's estrangement, and another was ISI's interference in the, in the negotiations and its desire to get involved uh, as the Taliban's negotiating agent, the Taliban's desire not to have a negotiating agent in Pakistan. Um, but since then, uh, diplomacy has once again taken you know, a, 
a, a receding role. Um, military action is prioritized again. ISI is back in action. There was a helicopter, a white um, helicopter that went down in Logar province uh, August before last, I guess, um, that was flying the same supply routes that ISI flew um, into the valley south of Kabul uh, during the 1980s. And uh, the Taliban kind of captured the uh, helicopter, which had a Russian pilot and a bunch of Pakistani citizens on board, and then uh, soon everyone surfaced back in Islamabad and the helicopter was burned. The Pakistani government explained that it had been flying without markings, disguised as a humanitarian helicopter, uh, so that it could uh, get repairs in Uzbekistan, which was not maybe the most plausible explanation um, that you've ever heard. But um, the war goes on, uh, and I think. The Trump administration has pressured Pakistan, uh, loosened rules of engagement, but they're fighting the same war with 10 to 15,000 troops that the Obama administration fought with 150,000 international troops. I just think it's uh, quite likely that in January 2021, when either the next president of the United States is inaugurated or President Trump is re-inaugurated, we'll still be at war in Afghanistan. So thank you for listening. Happy to take some Please. questions. Thanks. Many meetings with policymakers year after year after year, administration after administration. Did you find from research that anybody in those meetings had spent time in Afghanistan, spoke any of the Dar Af Afghan languages, uh, were maybe from Afghanistan themselves? Because many people who come here a long time before, like Khalil and Zah, uh, Khalil Zad, uh, Zalmay Khalil Zad. did anybody really know anything about Afghanistan itself, or was it all theoretical to them? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's a lot of these kind of characters who are the regional experts who um, are in the room in those meetings and who, are, who I make as kind of try to bring to life in the pages of the book to explain what the limits of their influence could be. So you had uh, language and regional experts from academia, from policy making. You, um, by the time you get to, and, and they would brief uh, and try to run a seminar to educate, you know, well-intentioned but very busy decision makers about s extremely complicated matters. And, you know, intelligence analysts and even policy advisors are advisors. And when they can set up the question and try to educate the decision makers, but then they're meant not to, you know, make the decisions. And if they're civil servants, they have to sometimes formally withdraw from the conversation because, oh, this is out of, you know, this is not my job. Um, the other thing that happened by you, the time you get to 2011, 2012, 12, and it's certainly a factor today in the Trump administration, we have H.R. McMaster as the National Security Advisor and um, James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, both uh, considerable war experience in Afghanistan, okay, war fighting experience. So a lot of the expertise in the system came from military um, officers who had served in Afghanistan. Now, they had a very hard and clear-eyed view of the problem of the Pakistani border as a factor in the war, um, but they're not anthropologists. Uh, and, and so their perspective on the war was what you would expect professional military officers to bring to the table, not what you would expect a political analyst or a, a diplomat to bring to the, to the table. Yes. We discussed the drone campaign. Obama launched this withering drone blitz uh, in 2007 eight, killed uh, the head of Taliban once, uh, number three in al-Qaeda twice, uh, wiped out the al-Qaeda network of other leaders. And, and uh, you know, in some ways, those drones were based in Shamsi, down in Bluchistan. And, some faction of ISI must be supporting them, but they're going after ISI assets, like the Al-Qaeda or yeah. Al-Qaeda or Afghan Taliban. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the ISI strategy in seemingly supporting the drone campaign against drone assets in Waziristan, uh, et cetera? Yeah, it's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right. I mean, describe it accurately. I mean, the... Um, so the, the initial purpose of the drone campaign was to strike al-Qaeda targets. Uh, and, and it's important to remember, uh, and even if you were a close reader of the newspaper in 2009, 2010, you might have forgotten that a significant factor in the willingness of the United States to accept the conduct of ISI in these years was that Pakistan was on fire. It was facing the worst domestic terrorism of its existence 
tens of thousands of Pakistanis died between 2007 and 2014 in domestic insurgent terrorist violence carried out by combinations of al-Qaeda and Pakistani Taliban and other groups, radical groups from the Punjab. And so the reason ISI tolerated the drone strikes initially was that there was an agreement that we'll kill your enemies as well as our enemies. Uh, and particularly as the Pakistani Taliban and al-Qaeda started to turn against the Pakistani state, I mean, they, they car-bombed ISI. I mean, they blew up an ISI building in Lahore at one point. They were going after the Army High Command. And the country was so unstable that in August 2009, there was a moment when the Pakistani Taliban came out of a, a mountainous region called Swat, and it looked like they were going to enter into Islamabad. I mean, people in Washington were panicked that a country with 100-plus nuclear weapons was about to fall to the Taliban. And the Pakistani army, in fact, fought back. But what happened was, as the years went by, uh, as the estrangement between ISI and CIA increased over the Pakistani accommodation of particularly the Haqqani network, but also other Afghan Taliban elements that were killing Americans in Afghanistan, was that the Americans basically stopped coordinating the targets as closely and stopped only shooting at shared enemies and started going after clients of the Pakistani state. And then they go into the Pakistanis and say, you know, I'm sorry, but these people are killing our people and you should be doing more about it. And if you're not willing, we're going to uh, take action. You know, if the Pakistanis made a calculation for a while that there were enough of their enemies still being targeted by these drones and they didn't have any comparable capacity themselves, um, that they would tolerate this. But when the relationship blew up and broke, basically, in 2011, it was substantially over uh, the decision in the Pakistani high command on their side, like, let's, let's break this pattern. Uh, and they withdrew a lot of the permissions uh, that they had been giving uh, the CIA and, and US Special Forces prior to that. Of course, we had our own reasons to be disappointed in the relationship when Osama bin Laden was discovered in Abbottabad in 2011 and killed there. And he'd been living there you know, for five or six years. Um, a mile or so from the Pakistani military academy. You discuss in the book um, the assassination of Massoud, the uh, guerrilla fighter, and that his body had been moved to Tajikistan in an effort to cover up the fact that he had been killed, and that there were three rep there were representatives from the Iranian, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan intelligence services there offering to help cover up the um, assassination so that nobody knew. I'm just wondering what the um, interest of those three countries in covering that up would be? So when we went to war in Afghanistan in 2001, um, the allies we chose to fight with, the, the so-called Northern Alliance, were primarily located in uh, the Panjshir Valley uh, and in Ahmad Shah Massoud's movement and his allies, uh, who were the last holdouts against total Taliban control of Afghanistan in 2001. And that um, withering resistance to the Taliban um, was supported internationally uh, by Iran, India, and Russia primarily, as well as Tajikistan and Uzbekistan to the extent those governments had capacity. And they wanted um, some effort to prevent the Taliban from taking over the country uh, entirely. So it was kind of a proxy war. Um, India seeing in the Northern Alliance a group that was um, aligned against Pakistan. Um, the effort to hide what had really happened was just a panic that with Massoud, who was such a charismatic and legendary commander, um, gone, that the front lines would collapse and the Taliban would overrun the valley. And uh, so the Iranians said, we can hide the body in Iran for a month if you want to keep up the fiction that he's just recovering from his wounds while you figure out a military succession plan. But one of the aides who was gathered at this little kind of stand-up meeting in the hospital or in the morgue in uh, Tajikistan, he was the principal liaison to the CIA, and he was told to call the Americans and tell them. So they agreed they would call all the six allies who were helping them in different ways in the war, including the CIA, and tell them the truth and ask for support in this transition period. So this guy goes back to Dushanbe, and he calls the CIA on a secure line and tells them Massoud's been assassinated. and then. Uh, eight, hours, eight hours later, it's moving on CNN. <laughs> uh, and he calls back to his liaison and says, you've put me in a very difficult position. This was supposed to be a secret. And the CIA guy said, well, you know, look, I mean, we're, 
our duty is when we have news that affects you know, international affairs, we have to tell the White House we can't control what they do with the information once they have it. I've always wondered what the monumental distraction of Iraq, what kind of impact it had, if any, on the course of the Afghan. And perhaps you could. Yeah, I think it had a profound impact on um, Afghanistan. You know, I, um, after working for a long time on a project like this, you know, you're always tempted into kind of counterfactual history, what might have been different. I don't believe much in counterfactual history. I don't think that's really the way the world works. But if you were going to look back over this history and say, where were the opportunities, the, the most significant opportunities? I mean, there's a... The book is organized in four sections, and the second one is called Losing the Peace, and it covers the years from 2002 to 2006. And so I think the answer is located in that moment after the Taliban have been defeated, the, their government, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, has been defeated. Their leaders, surviving leaders, have gone into exile in Pakistan. Al-Qaeda has surviving Al-Qaeda operatives, including bin Laden and Zawahiri, have migrated over the border into Pakistan. And um, the country is... Uh, in ashes and deeply impoverished, battered by decades of war, but it's peaceful. And the U.S.-led coalition enjoys very broad international support um, across not only NATO and Asia, but in Muslim countries. And what happens? Uh, three failures interact. One, the Bush administration was ideologically opposed to nation building and refused levels of reconstruction aid or engagement in building up Afghan security forces um, that were necessary. The Rumsfeld in particular, you know, had used Bosnia again and again as, a, as an example of something that he thought was, you know, a waste of American effort and resources and NATO effort and resources. Second thing was hubris about the defeated enemy. And we saw this again in Iraq, but it played out in Afghanistan in a way that has gotten less publicity but was no less important. What's the lesson of history when you defeat um, an enemy in a war? Um, yes, you can hold the enemy's leadership accountable. You can try people for war crimes if, it's, if you think that it's just and necessary. But you don't hold every foot soldier, every sergeant, every lieutenant who fought against you responsible for the war. You, you figure out how to build a path to reconciliation and political reintegration over time that will, that will stabilize um, the post-war environment. We did that in Germany. We did it in Japan. In Afghanistan, we treated every Taliban foot soldier as a candidate for Guantanamo, as uh, no different than the al-Qaeda hijackers who were on the planes or who, who, who ran their bank accounts. And um, we, in fact, shipped dozens and dozens and dozens of Afghans uh, who were picked up on the battlefield, uh, foot soldiers, farmers, to, Af to, to Guantanamo, or encourage their imprisonment in even worse facilities inside Afghanistan. And we sowed such bitterness, such bitterness, uh, through that hubristic approach to the defeated enemy. And then the third big factor, and maybe the biggest of all, was Iraq. And the, there's a sort of scene where the US military camp command comes in in early 2002 to try to set up um, their version of the peacekeeping operations and the terrorist, uh, counter-terrorist operations, very light footprint because of this uh, revulsion about investing in Afghanistan. And, uh, but it's still a significant base out at Bagram and they're getting themselves organized. And uh, one of the commanders is called to a conference in Europe and he comes back, this is about June of 2002, and he says to everybody in the command, we're going to war in Iraq, don't build anything permanent here. We're going to be tearing it down, you know, within months. Uh, and that, then not only did we, in fact, pull all of our resources in that direction, but the war bogged down and got worse and worse after 2004, as you'll remember. And this affected ISI's calculus because what we did as we started to get in trouble in Iraq was not only we pull all of our available forces into that war, but we turned... Um, peacekeeping in Afghanistan over to Canada, Britain, Holland, other NATO allies. And the Pakistanis saw that as us giving up on the war, thinking that it was over, leaving Afghanistan. Um, and so they started to have to think about, in their minds, we're thinking about a post-American Afghanistan now. 
and the Taliban has always been part of our influence strategy to keep India at bay in our large and unruly neighborhood. So as the Taliban, seeded with bitterness, started to revive, the ISI thought that they had a strategic reason to accommodate that revival because we were leaving and we were off in Iraq in a forever war. The other thing that happened during that same period was the Bush administration struck a strategic nuclear deal with India in which we essentially forgave India for breaking out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, building its own nuclear weapons system, and promised them lavish support for their civilian nuclear uh, power plans. And uh, we told the Pakistanis, sorry, you're not going to get that deal. You're not reliable enough. You ha you're the country of AQ Khan, nuclear smugglers. And so the Pakistani High Command sees the United States leaving, bogged down in Iraq. Their neighborhood is going back to kind of post-American realities. And they say to themselves, you've made yourselves plain. They've made themselves plain. India is their strategic ally for the 21st century. We're not. And so we better watch after our own interests. And that, I think, informs the attitude of the Pakistan army to the Taliban's revival, which really becomes intense by 2006. Uh, you tell a story in the book about a meeting between Kayani and Clinton, and how Kayani walks into the meeting and he throws on the table Bob Woodward's book, Obama's Wars. Yes. And so I'm curious now, you've written a book. And <laughs> so when you're writing a book like this, do you, do you think about the effect it could have on interpersonal dynamics or intergovernmental dynamics? And is that, is that something you think about at all? Or, and if so, how do, you, how do you think about it? Well, I think about it as, um, as in a positive way. I think transparency is ultimately beneficial to everyone. I think, um, you know, the populations of all three of the affected countries deserve access to the secret history of how this violence uh, arose and what decisions were made about it. And I, one of the things I really tried to do in uh, Ghost Wars and in this book was to provide as much transparency and empathy and understanding and humanization um, as I could for the Pakistani decision makers as I did for the Americans and for the Afghans. That was certainly my goal. Um, I'm an American. I know the American system really well. Inevitably, I can describe it in more nuance and depth. But, um, you know, Kayani's role in the war is uh, really important, uh, ambiguous. He was, uh, you know, he's not an evildoer. He is a very, he's in a very complicated position, and I wanted to try to bring him to life. I love that scene where he brings the, the book um, in, and it's got all these post-it notes in it, and he says to <coughs> Hillary Clinton, you know, how, how do you allow this sort of thing to happen in your government? But in fact, he found the book extremely useful in un understanding how complicated and dysfunctional American interagency decision-making <laughs> was. Uh, and, uh, and you'll see there's a fair, I did a, a lot of reporting to get Pakistani documents and Pakistani letters and memos uh, on the record in the book alongside the American ones so that you can hear their voices too and see, see how they saw this play out. But, um, you know, look, I mean, any journalist who's working in national security areas who's um, thinking about the consequences of their reporting in a responsible way, you know, there's a few, like, ticking bomb you know, you don't want to jeopardize uh, lives uh, in some way about imminent war action or something like that. Um, but the larger picture of how secret decision making happens over decades, I mean, we should know more about that, not less. And one of my sources during the fact checking said, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of record in here and I kind of tried to tell a story but also wanted to make sure I was as full with the material as I could be. And he, was, he said, you know, this is probably as close to the Pentagon Papers as we're going to have about this for a while. And I thought, you know, that's probably an overstatement, but that was definitely the way I thought about it. <laughs> so, and, and, and there were a lot of people who helped because they wanted uh, the American people, as well as Afghans and Pakistanis, to understand what had happened. That's what this is, what happened. Yeah. All right, thank you.